Well, thank you, Martin, and thank you for the Institute of Telecommunications Professionals for inviting me to deliver this year's series of lectures. And thank you also to the mobile phone company EE, who is supporting this series of lectures as we go around the country. And welcome, everybody, to the University of Salford's Media City campus. So we're delighted to have you on site today. The talk is your world in your hand. And what we're really looking at is 40 years of the mobile phone. And I thought it'd be useful to start by asking you to raise your hand if you have an operational mobile phone. Excellent. Now keep your hands in the air if you have two operational mobile phones. Three. OK, uh, four. OK, we'll be topped out at three there, which was quite nice. If you actually do a statistic which says, let's count how many operational mobile phones there are in the country and divide by the number of people that are living in the UK, the statistical fact, and you can tell your friends and family this when you go home, there are more mobile phones in the United Kingdom than there are people. Such is the dominance of the mobile phone. How many of those mobile phones actually have a camera? Again, a large number, 83% of mobiles now have a camera fitted to them. How many of you in the audience are active on Twitter? Right, OK, it's mainly this side of the room, strangely. <laughs> um, that is good, because we'll do something about Twitter towards the end. Um, 200 million active users on Twitter, sending over 400 million tweets a day. What about Facebook? How many people use their mobile for Facebook? Right, and again, 680 million active users on their mobile phone every month. What about internet access? How many people use their mobiles for accessing the internet? Again, a healthy number. 13% of all internet traffic now comes from mobile phones. And the monthly mobile data is 900,000 gigabytes of data on a phone. This is a phone, and it's doing all this data service. I assume a lot of you have got smartphones. How many have got apps on their smartphones and download apps? Again, a good healthy number. 56 billion apps will be downloaded, it is estimated, this year. And that will split roughly 14% on the Apple system and 79% on Android. So apps and data and cameras and social media are big uses of the mobile phone. Notice I didn't ask how many people make phone calls. <laughs> it all started 40 years ago, back on the 3rd of April 1973, with this man, uh, Dr. Martin Cooper from Motorola, who made the first mobile phone that would work and the mobile phone call. He's holding the phone, but I must stress this photograph was taken this year to celebrate the 40th anniversary. And obviously, he was a lot younger in 1973. So this year, we're still in 2013, is the 40th anniversary year. And that's why we felt for these ITP lectures, it would be appropriate to look at the mobile phone. But of course, the origins of the mobile phone go much, much further back than 40 years. And here, in the northwest of England, the South Lancashire Radio Telephone Service was one of the first, the first in the country, to actually allow you to have a phone in your car. And of course, people always show you the pictures like this one of somebody using the telephone, uh, sat at their driver's wheel. What they very rarely show you is the picture in the middle, because this is the boot of the car. And you can see a large box in the boot. That is actually the electronics that makes that phone work. You needed a car to carry the electronics that made this work. Going from a radio telephone in the car to something which you can hold actually requires you to un overcome several engineering challenges. The first of which is how we actually get the signal from the mobile phone that you're carrying to the network, which is shown by the mast. Now, we're going to do a few demos in this lecture, and this is where the first one is going to happen. So we're looking for some volunteers that Martin is organising who can help us demonstrate how this works. Would you like to step up here? Just take care with the step. 
And don't step backwards if you're standing there. <laughs> you hold that. And your name is? Daniel. Daniel. And you? Ryan. 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 So Daniel and Ryan. Right. Daniel, you're going to throw those balls. We'd just like to turn side on so the audience can see you and stand a little bit closer here. Ryan, you're catching. All right? <laughs> now, just try and throw a ball into there. Good. Do it again. Oh, <laughs> it was a fluke. Go on, try it again. <laughs> okay. Now, go on, one more. Let's just step back a little bit further, about there, and try it again. Good. Whoa, yes. Okay. Now, just step off the stage briefly there and trigger further away. Try again. Oh. <laughs> Can you see any, what's, is it any different the further away you go? Yeah. What's happening? What's it different for? It's further to travel. And how are you finding that? It's harder. It's harder to throw. Do you want to step back up on the stage? What you're finding is that the further away you are, it's harder to throw. So if you are a mobile phone and these red balls were radio, you would need more energy to get the signal to the radio mast the further away you are. So what that tells us, um, just pick up my remote control here, is that if we want to build a portable system, what we really want to be is the phone as close to the mast as we can. And then we're not going to use as much energy because that energy is going to come from the battery. And we want a small battery if we're going to carry this thing. So first thing, we would really like the phone to be as close to the radio mast as possible. OK, stay where you are, because what would happen if we had two mobile phones communicating? So Martin, have we got another person who can help us? And your name? Edward. Edward. Now, this is not a distance test, so just come a little bit closer to make life easy for you. OK, you've got to deal with two phone calls now. So, would you like to try and throw the balls into there? OK, it's going well. Both phone calls are going through, aren't they? OK, now just stop there a moment. Could you give me the balls that Edward's just thrown you, please? <laughs> How do you know those are his? <laughs> What's the problem? Is you don't know which one's which. which you one's don't know which one's which. Why don't we know which is which? You get mixed in. And they're both red. Mm. So if this is a mobile phone call and these two people are on the same colour, in radio terms the same frequency, you won't know whose call is whose. What do you think we could do to solve this problem? Change the frequencies. Change the frequencies. Good on you. And that means change the colour. <laughs> right. <laughs> Try again. <laughs> now can you show me which balls Edward threw? Isn't that easy? Yeah. Right. So we also need, if we're going to have lots of mobiles, they've all got to have different frequencies. And you've demonstrated that beautifully. Just pop them on the floor. And let's give, them, let's give them a round of applause for their contribution. Thank you. So, we need the mobiles to be as close to the mast as possible to keep the energy levels down and small batteries, and we need the phones to be on different frequencies so they don't interfere with each other. How on earth can we solve that engineering problem? Well, believe it or not, it was solved back in 1947 by very appropriately named Douglas Ring uh, and William Young. And they came up with a solution which, sadly, could not be built in 1947 because we didn't have the technology. And they produced this document, which is a Bell Labs internal report called Mobile Telephony Wide Area Coverage. And this was published in the 11th of December, 1947. So the concept, the solution to this problem had been sorted as early as 1947. And they spotted something very important. And they came up with something which we call a cellular system represented on this screen here. You have lots of radio masts represented by the radio mast symbol. And you keep the transmission power low so that the distance that the signals travel is confined to what we call a cell. And the clever part was to realize that a signal on the far left of this network would not reach the far right. 
too far away because the power levels are low. So we could use the frequencies we have over here over there again because they would not interfere. We could use red balls here because the red ball will not be received over there and we can use red again. And this is called frequency reuse and this is the secret to mobile phone operations. Here's the mobile phone on the left. The radio mast it's communicating with is on frequency set A. And whilst it's in that cell, that mobile phone will stay on frequency A. When it moves to the next cell, it switches frequency to that cell, which is B. And it will stay on B through that cell. And then, when it goes on to the final cell, it goes to A again and can continue. So now, we don't need a frequency for every phone in the country because we can reuse a limited set of frequencies over and over again, providing no two adjacent cells are on the same frequency. And this is the concept of the cellular system. The first practical network launched in America was in 1977, and in Europe, 1981, the Nordic mobile telephone system, NMT, in Scandinavia. And we're going to show you how this would work as well. And Martin, we're going to need four volunteers this time. <laughs> so, you're going to stand over there, and you're going to be on red. Someone in the middle, please. On blue. Uh, one of you, who would like to catch and who would like to throw? Catch. You're catching, so you're throwing. You hold those. Now, do you want to step down on the floor? Okay, so, face, face forward, face your audience. <laughs> you're represented by the A aerial on the screen, you're represented by the B, and you're represented by the A, and you're the mobile phone. So what I want you to do is walk slowly, straight line here, and as you're walking, when you see him close by, throw a ball, so you're gonna get the red, so throw the red, now we're gonna blow, and now we go red. The mobile phone has changed frequency as it moved through these three cells. So that was quite quick, so let's do that again. And feel f free to throw more than one ball. So blue, red. Do you want to come back again? So <laughs> red, now we switch to blue, and now we switch to red. And this works because the chances of a red ball from here being thrown to you and getting mixed up here like we did before isn't going to happen. So the fact we're on red here means that we can continue to use red over here, they won't interfere with each other. Okay, well, thank you very much for that demo. And again, can we just give them all a, a round of applause? Thank you. So this cellular concept is what actually makes mobile phones possible. The United Kingdom actually got mobile phone services on the 1st of January, 1985. And it was inaugurated on the Vodafone network by this celebrity of the day, Ernie Wise. And Morecambe and Wise, of course, has celebrated only just recently. There's been a television series celebrating the work of Morecambe and Wise. And there was a stage play called The Play What He Wrote, celebrating the work of Morecambe and Wise. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is the call what he made. Ernie Wise inaugurated the mobile phone network of the UK. 1st of January, 1985. This map shows how that network would roll out on the Cellnet network, which was the second of the UK's two mobile phone networks. The light-coloured cells are where the service was operating in June 85, and the dark-coloured cells where it would have been at the end of 85. And very typically, it's the centres of population, London, Birmingham, Manchester, and the main connecting routes between them that we used first. And of course, mobile phones then look like this. This is, a, as shown on the screen, a Motorola 8500. Anybody want to hazard a guess how much you would have paid for that brand new in that time? <laughs> it's two and a half to 3,000 pounds. So inevitably, not a lot of people had one. Uh, you had to be quite rich or have one of these through your work. Motorola uh, had this one, uh, Nokia had the Cityman 1320, very similar phone. 
but Motorola were really, really pioneering in mobile phone design. This is the first flip phone ever developed, the MicroTAC by Motorola. Again, a marvel of miniaturization compared to what uh, we had before. We still have the very big brick phones, or sometimes you might call them a breeze block phone. Uh, the Nokia system always preferred candy bar design, no flips or moving parts like this one here. Uh, and of course, Motorola continued to innovate with this, the world's first clamshell phone, and a clamshell phone folds completely in half, like so. And this is the Motorola StarTac. This phone was the world's smallest and lightest phone when it was released. However, it cost more pound for pound or gram for gram than its equivalent weight in gold when it was on sale. So is it any wonder that ownership of mobile phones 10, 11 years after the launch was still quite low? In fact, mobile phone ownership in 95 was about 7% of the UK population. So for most people, the closest you got to making a phone call whilst outside was this, the nice painted red box. This was your mobile phone for most people in the country. And actually it wasn't obvious that we were gonna stop using mobile phones, uh, sorry, kiosks in favor of mobile phones then. If you went into a kiosk at this time, you would have seen posters like this. Why get soaked when you can phone from our place a nice dry phone box? Mobile phones might be getting lighter, but they can still be heavy on your pocket. Yes, they were getting lighter, but still cost a lot of money. And of course, you don't get a flat battery in a kiosk. The kiosk was still fighting back for usage. But the biggest problem with mobile phones was that you got to the English Channel and they stopped because every European country had adopted a system which was fundamentally incompatible with each other. So if you had a mobile phone in the UK, it wouldn't work in France or Germany or whatever. The phone stopped when you crossed the border. And this is a real problem for generating a mobile phone network which is truly European or indeed global. And the European Union actually set about solving this problem and um, Chris Ghent of Vodafone said the document this is going to show you here was the most important document in the history of the mobile phone. There it is on the left. It's a memorandum of understanding on the implementation of a pan-European 900 megahertz digital cellular mobile telecommunication service by 1991. This was a system that would work anywhere in Europe. And this was the goal. And really, the European Union, this is a massive success story for EU. And what was developed was, in fact, what we now know as uh, Global Systems for Mobile, initially Group System for Mobile, GSM Standard. This has been a world beater. It is an amazing European success story. This actually allowed mobile phones to work in any country in Europe, and in fact, has been adopted around the world. And it's a digital system. Those first uh, mobile phones were analog. This is the first um, digital phone from Motorola, the 3200, and Nokia's equivalent, the 1011. It's often wondering how on earth they come up with these numbers. But Nokia's 1011 is an easy one. It was launched on the 10th of November, 1011. That's where the number came from. In the UK then, we actually went digital with Vodafone in July 92, a new entrant company, one to one, in September 93. The other original network, Cellnet, went digital in December 93, and Orange, a new entrant, in 94. Four mobile phone operators. And once you could make a phone that would work anywhere in Europe, you've got the economies of scale which allows mass production and driving the price down and new manufacturers enter. So Siemens, Nokia, Samsung, Ericsson, Bosch, Alcatel. Some of those names were already there. Others come in once we go GSM. So the phone is now getting cheaper and being made by a lot more people. And the UK goes mobile phone crazy. Vertically, 
is the percentage of the UK population that has a mobile phone. But careful with statistics. It's like that first one we started with. You add up how many mobile phones there are in the country and divide by the population. It doesn't mean everyone has one, of course. And if you have a look at 1999, this is where the curve accelerates phenomenally. And at that point, a new mobile phone was being sold every four seconds in the UK. And then, of course, in 2004, we reached that statistical anomaly where mobile phone ownership in the UK breaks through the 100% boundary. <coughs> Does anybody know who this person is? So somebody called Neil Papworth, which is possibly not a name you've heard of before, but this man did something really rather incredible. He sent a message called Merry Christmas, and it's the first recorded text message ever sent. And he sent it on the 3rd of December. We've just celebrated its birthday as 7th of December today. It's only a few days ago that we celebrated the birthday of the text message. Because once you've gone digital, you can send text as well as voice. So the mobile phone now is not just about making phone calls. You can send data as well as voice. Now, I reckon you're pretty good at text messaging. So what we're going to do is uh, have a little test, because just look at this statistic. This is the number of text messages sent in the UK. And look at the growth, well up now to almost 160 billion messages a year. In fact, Ofcom reckon the average UK user sends 50 text messages every week. Now, every time we put that statistic up, the youngsters all have a little giggle, because they do that every day. <laughs> this is... This is averaged across the whole population. For the world, 9.8 trillion text messages were sent last year. But everybody thinks 2013 will be a changing year. This will be the year where we think text messages will decline because of the growth in all of the other social media methods. So I'm sure you're all brilliant text message people. So we're going to have what we call audience participation time and everybody gets a bit worried when you say things like that what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a text and I want you to translate it to English and I want you to shout it out when you've actually worked out what it is so let's start with one to get the idea going tomorrow, tomorrow. there we are you see it's not hard is it so you've got the hang of it let's have another one Wow. Be right back. <laughs> Notice it was the youngster who got that one. <laughs> Later. First again. <laughs> Just kidding. And these, by the way, are not made up. I have taken them off uh, appropriate websites of top uh, abbreviations. Oh. Oh, have we found the level? <laughs> Anybody want to hazard a guess? <laughs> you got the others? No? My hat's off to you. <laughs> God, here's a challenge. When you go home today, set yourself the challenge of sending a text message with M-H-O-T-Y in it, and then you've actually used it and experienced it. There's a lot of murmuring now. I'm hearing some of it. What, what's o OMG? Oh my, oh my God. LOL. <laughs> Laugh out loud. I've made the last one up, actually. <laughs> Oxford English Dictionary. Because as of March 2011, <coughs> OMG and LOL are now officially in the Oxford English Dictionary as words, thereby showing you how telecommunications technology changes the very language that we use to communicate. So those of you in schools, if you put OMG or LOL in your, tech, in your writing, technically, the teacher can't mark you wrong now because they are official words of the Oxford English Dictionary. But don't tell them I said that. <laughs> you can also represent people or characters. Now, this is a, a famous 
character, you may find it easier to tip your head on one side and blur your eyes to see if you can spot something that you might recognise here. Homer Simpson. Have a look at that. The equal signs are the two tufts of hair on his head. The number eight is his eyes. The brackets with the one, his mouth. You got the idea? Again, I've not made this up, by the way. This is official. I'll give you one more. Is it better leaning to the right or being to the left? <laughs> Bit of a wizard, this one. <laughs> yeah, it's Harry Potter. The official text message of Harry Potter. <laughs> so there you go, M-H-O-T-Y and Harry Potter. Uh, you can put that all in a text message and see how many of your friends actually understand what you're saying. What you have to remember with the mobile phone is that it evolved at the same time as the internet. And let's just look at those two paths. We began constructing the internet in 1969 and the mobile phone in 1973. The first digital networks on the mobile in 1985 and the World Wide Web in 1989. GSM Digital in 1992, the first internet service provider for the general public in the UK, Demon Internet, 1992. So they're running a parallel path. Internet Explorer came packaged with Windows 95. You no longer had to go and buy a web browser, it was part of the package. And people like Nokia had started to integrate the computer into the mobile phone with devices like this, the communicator range, the 9000. So the obvious point was, why don't we try and connect the internet and the mobile phone together? And Nokia actually did that with this phone, the Nokia 7110. This was the first web browser mobile phone. It has a rather nice scroll wheel in the middle for navigating through the web pages and so on. But that screen is very small. And the trouble is, actually, for accessing the web, this was pretty rubbish. Not technologically, everybody was used to the computer screen, the large screen, colour. This wasn't colour, this is very small. The web experience was really rather poor, but it was marketed as being the same as the web you get at home on the phone. So it was overhyped. And unfortunately, this proved this first generation of WAP, wireless application protocol, and these mobile phone browsers weren't that successful because people were expecting it to be the same as their home computer, and it wasn't. However, today, hasn't the world changed? 50% of UK users use their mobile phone to access the web, and 45% out and about. So the mobile phone now is very much a use of the uh, internet. Here's an interesting phone. Uh, this phone knows Einstein's equation. Why do you think it knows Einstein's equation? It's a smart phone. <laughs> Look, <laughs> I think Martin uh, explained at the beginning, this is the ITP family Christmas presentation. Therefore, I am allowed one corny cracker joke in the lecture, and this is it, <laughs> the smartphone. But you see, this is the point. Once you start putting computers into a phone and you connect that phone to the internet, it's not a phone anymore, so we need a word that de can describe what it is. And that word became the smartphone. And so we learnt this new word. IBM were one of the early people to integrate computers and phones together. Orange, now part of EE of course, pioneered this device, Orange Video Phone, which had computer, phone and video capability in one package. But the first phone to use the word smartphone, as shown in the top picture, was the Ericsson R380 using the word smartphone. And of course, you start seeing other phones coming along, the famous BlackBerry range, and so on. The computer and the phone marrying together. But you see, the mobile phone network was designed for voice, voice communications. 
It wasn't designed for internet access, although it's digital. This kind of grew out of a user requirement. Text messaging was an, an afterthought in one sense that took off enormously with the general public. This is how the mobile phone network is wired up behind the scenes. And if you have a mobile phone, then the phone call goes through the voice network. But if you try and put the data through that as well, it's going to be very limited. In fact, those of you that were early internet users might remember dial-up modems. And that was quite slow. What the mobile operators decided to do was extend the network to provide a data service on top of the voice. And that's represented by this additional data network shown at the bottom. And now, if you wanted to send data, that went on the blue line through a dedicated network for data, and the voice went through the existing mobile phone network for voice. That system, separation of voice from data, was known as the General Packet Radio Service, GPRS 2.5G, because we've moved on a generation uh, from second generation now to 2.5G. And what I want to do this time is try and demonstrate how we do this separation. So we're going to need, Martin, some more uh, volunteers. I think we need four uh, for this one. Uh, well, that's not quite right, because we're going to have the whole audience involved in this one. Oh, don't worry about that. OK. Right. So we better have you... I've got four people. Do you want to stand down here? Um, leave those there. Uh, if you want to come and stand about there. You are a mobile phone, the network, OK? And uh, do you want to be the mobile phone network? And I'm going to put that bucket there. And you two are mobile phones, OK? Now, if you have one of those each, and stand at nearest point of your network. So one of you over here, and one of you here. Now, the balls are going to represent voice call, and data is going to be represented by these envelopes. Whenever you send data on the internet, we use a system called packet switching. And with packet switching, what we do, we take a whole message and we break it up into small pieces represented here by the envelopes, and they are sent through the network independently. Now, the mobile phone here and here wants to make a voice call and access the internet. So you will give a ball or an envelope to your network. So you will give a ball or an envelope to your network. Now, the network has to separate voice from data. So if you receive a ball, it's a blue ball, I've got these buckets the wrong way around. Right. You will throw the ball, blue ball into that bucket representing that the voice is going that way. If you receive a red ball, you throw it into that bucket representing the voice going that way. If you get an envelope, <laughs> I hope you're still with me on this, <laughs> um, you will pass it to the audience. And you will pass an envelope to the audience. You are the data network. If you get an envelope, you should pass it to somebody next to you. Doesn't matter who. The only thing I want you to do, if you see a green envelope, head it so that we're getting the green envelopes in this direction. If you see a yellow envelope, please try and get it this way over here. When you receive an envelope, give it to the mobile phone, open it, and we're going to try and reassemble the message. If you receive a green envelope, pass it to us. Appropriate, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> pass it to the mobile phone. You open the envelopes, and we see if we can get your message. <sighs> Did you understand that? <laughs> right. So balls that way, envelopes that way, green here, yellow here. That's what we're going to try and do now. And you're going to have to throw ball, give balls and envelopes on a regular basis, okay? And you've got a lot of work to do. <laughs> right. There we go. In your own time. Envelope, envelope to the audience, balls this way. So just go on, if you start passing them around, don't worry if it just misses. So the balls are going this way, represent the voice call, the envelopes going into the data network, envelopes into the data network, don't worry about dropping the ball, doesn't matter. Okay, balls this way, date, data that way, phone this way, envelopes that way. If you get a yellow back, yellow to the mobile phone, start opening the yellows, keep transmitting the greens. 
Have you sent all yours? Right. <laughs> okay. Right. So do you want me to help you open those? Because yeah. you do it right. Martin, maybe you want to help open in the green envelopes at that end. Have you got some more? <laughs> so we got the phone calls going this way. The data is going separated out. So the voice calls going lovely. <laughs> are we? How are we doing? <laughs> oh, we got another one there. Okay, you can put that down if you want to. <laughs> now, what you find with packet switching is that every one of those envelopes, the data inside it, is encoded so that we know the sequence. And what we're trying to do is reassemble that now uh, in this particular order. So, have we got an intelligible message? So you can see here the sequence number at the top. How are we doing there? That's all right. OK, do you want to read out what we've been able to recover? Life would be very dull without. Without something. We didn't get all the messages back. And what have we got on this side? Do you want to read out what you've got? I am pleased that the mobile has got smaller. I'm pleased that the mobile's got smaller. So what we've done, we stuck the data and sent it through a data network, and we kept the voice separate. So now the mobile phone network is recognizing that data is becoming just as important, if not more important, than voice, and it's separating the two out so that each gets uh, a better service. OK, well, thank you again for that, and thank you, everyone in the audience, for participating. Once we've gone to 2.5G, the data carrying capacity of our mobile phones increased. Cellnet launched the, U the world's first GPRS service in June 2000, and now we're starting to see phones that are using the data capability of the network. Here's two examples of a GPRS phone. But once you can send data sensibly, you start to see other things change on the mobile. Screens, like on this Ericsson T68, go colour. Screens on this Nokia 7650 get a bit larger. Email. You're now, on a data network, able to send email. So, for example, the BlackBerry pioneered business email service. Here, the Motorola Razr, again, a, s a network that can handle data and email and so on. But, of course, what we also start to see is a multimedia capability on the phone. And the most obvious one of those is the camera. The Sony Ericsson here, a 0.1 megapixel camera. The Motorola pushes it to 0.3. And then the Sharp GX30, the first one megapixel camera phone. Because if you take a picture and you have a data network, you can send that picture uh, as a multimedia message. Already from 2003, we were selling more mobile phones with cameras than standalone digital cameras. And in 2006, um, oh, half of all phones manufactured had cameras built in. And of course, again, the mobile phone dominates the world. In 2003, officially, it was announced that the word selfie is now the word of 2013. So in celebration of that, uh, I took a selfie. Uh, and there it is. <laughs> and of course, I was holding a, a, a brick phone. So, Again, you see, the selfie, the concept of a selfie would not have happened without a phone. Pushing the data continued, and we moved on to another generation of mobile phone called Edge, and this is often called uh, 2.75G, and Orange launched the UK's first Edge network, and that was the device that they made available at the time, the BlackBerry 8700G, the, the first mobile phone on Orange that could take edge, higher speed data. We're now driving everything based on data. But that's still not enough, still not enough. And so the mobile phone network evolves again to generate a much better data carrying capacity. How did they do that? Well, they changed the radio interface and made that better for data. And they improved the internal data network 
that you saw the envelopes going through here. That became known as 3G, third generation mobile phone. And of course, it was symbolized by much higher data capacity. The voice side, pretty well unchanged. Voice had been sorted long time ago. Voice was not the problem. Data, data, data is the problem. That's where we need more capacity. And once you've got this higher data capacity, you've got to have a license to operate. And this is perhaps what 3G is most remembered for, uh, most known for, the price paid for the licenses. The mobile phone industries paid £22.47 billion pounds to the exchequer for a piece of paper that said you can launch a 3G network. And that happened in April 2000. But what's fascinating about this is if you look at the date when those networks went live. You take £22 billion pounds out of an industry and then say, now build a network, they've no cash left to do it. The UK had to wait three or four years before we then got 3G. And that loss of um, benefit uh, actually undermined the £22 billion that was got in 2000. But of course, we go 3G, we start seeing 3G phones. And a lot of them now have cameras facing you as well as facing away. Because with the higher data rate, we could do video conferencing. So these are some early examples of the Motorola, the Nokia, NEC 3G phones. And so the, the mobile network, the mobile phone continued to evolve. In 2006, we all knew what a 3G smartphone looked like, and it looked like this, a Nokia N95. That was the phone that you dreamed for. That was the epitome of mobile phone development, the Nokia N95. Slider with a keyboard and 3G. What we didn't know in 2006 is the world was about to change. Because what was going to happen, a company who had specialized in computers decided to have a look at the design of phones for the first time. So when you get a computer company designing a phone, as opposed to a phone company designing a phone, you get a different take on how it should look. That company was Apple. That product was the iPhone. If you look at mobile phones pre-2007, they look like the Nokia N95. You look at mobile phones post the iPhone, they look like the iPhone. This changed mobile phone design. You put a computer firm in charge of designing a phone, they see it as a computer first and a phone second. The phone companies had a different take on it. This changed the market. And of course, we got the app, the bit of software that you can download and run on your phone and actually make it usable without having to fiddle around with all of these commands and the keyboard. The app was born. And both the Apple iPhone store and Android now have over a billion apps each to download onto their respective systems. And if you look at the um, statistics for the usage of apps, um, the most popular app used, as reported by Global Web Index, is Google Maps. And of course, Google Maps relies on the fact that your phone has a GPS satellite tracking system in it. And this Sony Ericsson uh, Walkman here was the first Sony Ericsson to have GPS built in. Once this phone knows where you are, now you have mapping applications that can work. And the other big heavy users, the positions two through to six, are all social media. Facebook, YouTube, Google+, uh, WeChat was one I didn't know about, and Twitter. These are the most popular apps um, from the second quarter this year. And this is done by a survey of mobile phone users. And social media is really interesting, in particular Twitter, because Twitter really is the mobile phone social network. Um, each tweet is about 140 characters long. Approximately 5,000 tweets a second are sent on Twitter. And 60% of Twitter users use their mobiles to send these tweets. When Twitter launched, 
it measured how many tweets had been sent and one billion was sent three years, two months and one day after the launch of Twitter. So from the launch of Twitter to the time it had sent a billion tweets, it was what, three years, two months and one day. Now that amount is sent every 48 hours. Two days. Now this is where I want to do a little Twitter challenge. Those of you who have got Twitter on your mobile phones, get them ready. Um, we want to do a challenge. What I want you to do is with your camera phones, of course, with your Twitter account, take my photograph now and tweet it using the hashtag ITPXmas2013. And later on in the lecture, towards the, almost at the end, we'll have a look at how many have come through. So there we go. I will stand here and you can take a picture of me and tweet it using the hashtag ITPXmas2013. That's quite nice, this, looking at the beach. <laughs> Being the centre of attention here. <laughs> now, I know this takes a little while to log on to the system, but we'll just leave it now. OK. So leave those Twitter users now to busily try and uh, tweet. So the hashtag is ITPXmas2013. And we'll see who got there first. OK. Oh, just got another picture there. <laughs> Your phone was turned off. There we go. OK. Well, for the non-Twitter users, we'll move on and, and come back to this later. More than a fifth of mobile users have purchased goods and services online. Half of UK adults now access the internet from their mobiles. Mobile internet access ac increased fivefold between the 55 and 64 year olds. It's not just a young person's game this, by the way. <coughs> radio listening. BBC now has a new app for listening to radio. Has risen uh, significantly in the last 12 months. Almost a fifth of mobile internet users access the internet almost every day using their mobile. And these are all official Ofcom statistics. One fifth of adults say they would miss their mobiles most if they were without them. And I find this next one fascinating. One in five 16 to 24 year olds agree that it's okay to start a relationship using text based services. How, to, how the world changes. But don't take that too far because this was a letter in the Daily Telegraph letter page recently. I recently gave birth to my second child and, on, and I'm very upset that my husband, who was present at the birth, well, he'd have thought he'd have got a brownie point for that, uh, did not give me a kiss, cuddle, pat on the back or well done after going through labour. He was looking at his phone through most of my labour and the midwife had to ask him several times to help me in basic ways like getting me a glass of water or a towel. So you can get a bit obsessive with your smartphones um, so don't take it too far, uh, too extremes but it is dominating a lot of how we live in society. As we move on, 3G is still not enough. The data volumes are so important now the mobile phone companies have moved the networks on to the fourth generation. And the fourth generation mobile phone network for the first time ever is data only. There is no voice service in the mobile phone network on 4G. It is data only. It's all envelopes, no balls, is the analogy of what we've just seen. Everything is envelopes, including your voice. So if you want to send your data through the network, this is a data network. It goes through at high speed. If you want to send your voice, it actually has to be converted from data to voice and from voice back to data. And that will be done by the network. And this, of course, is the 4G long-term evolution or LTE standard. The licenses for those have brought in 2.36 billion, not as much as obviously the uh, 3G license, but look at this. The auction was February 2013 and we've now got 
four of these operators launched with 4G networks. EE booked the trend, of course, and launched with a special arrangement in October last year. Then we had Vodafone and O2 in August, and three have just launched their 4G service. And of course, 4G is now symbolized by things like this Galaxy S4 smartphone, which is 4G compatible. So how good is 4G? Well, we can do a demo, and you can see this for yourself, out at the cafe. Unfortunately, this room is a bit like a screened box. So the 4G signal in this particular part of the building is not that brilliant, but out by the cafe is fantastic. And I'm going to show you a film of a speed test we did um, of these two phones. On the left is my iPhone 3GS, and on the right, Samsung Galaxy S4 on 4G. They're doing a download speed test. Look at the numbers on the right on 4G. They're up at 25, 26 megabits per second download. My iPhone on 3G hasn't yet reached a megabit. Upload, 4G on the right, well over 10 megabit per second, pushing 13 now. The iPhone, 0.05. You are now getting, on a mobile phone, more internet access capability than some people have on their landlines at home. But look at this. Look at the figure at the top, oops, 51, 51 milliseconds latency on 4G, several hundred milliseconds on 3G. Not only is it faster, it's actually got less delay as well. So this is uh, Twitter. Let's just see if we've got anybody coming in here. Um, we had Helen Stott. Is that put, hey! Helen Stott seemed to be first with um, the tweet. And then we had Odom Rowe, Emma Allison, and uh, Bashir who came in. So well done, everybody, uh, for sending those tweets in. And it worked. <laughs> this is what life looked like in 1973. That that Martin Cooper is holding is the one and only truly mobile phone. It's a device for making a phone call. That was the mobile phone. Today's Galaxy S4, this thing is not a mobile phone. This is a pocket computer, a mobile computer that can make a phone call. It's a computer first and a phone second. That was a phone only. And it, you'd have felt a bit strange walking around holding that in 1973. People would have looked at you as odd. I wonder how people now view technology. Well, I was upstairs in our building here at Media City, and I spied some of our students actually talking to each other in a group discussion. <laughs> <laughs> Up on the uh, top floor of our, and some of them are actually in the room today. <laughs> Also on their phones, I can see. Um, <laughs> their world is most definitely in their hands. And I think for a lot of you, if you think about it, your world is very much in your hand. And with that, I would say thank you for your attention. Thank you for your contributions. And uh, thank you for the ITP.